have Travis Shelton, who's at UNM and Sandia, and he's going to tell us that uh, Hilbert space is not what we think it is. Uh, maybe, possibly. Can people in the back hear me OK? OK, good. Could people who are standing up uh, come grab a, grab a, uh, a chair, please? That would be super helpful. OK, this worked in the speaker ready room. Yeah. Yay, OK. There we go. We got it. Uh, so th for those of you who want to follow along at home, the slides are available on my website, travis-s.github.io. So if, if you want to take pictures of the slides, this is the one slide that you should take a picture of. OK. So broadly speaking, I'm going to talk about problems that are related to tomography, specifically quantum state tomography. I'm going to tell you a little bit about why tomography is hard, why tomography for continuous variable systems is even harder, and then I'll tell you a way that I've been working on to try and make it a little bit easier. So frankly, tomography is hard simply because we are attempting to make the unknown knowable. You know, we've heard some stuff about gate set tomography. They have the black boxes that they make. You know, here is, for all intents and purposes, a black box. If there's anyone who is really likes D-Wave in the audience, please don't throw things at me until I get done. From tomography, we want to take these black boxes and turn them into things that we can control, things that we can run quantum algorithms on or quantum simulations. Uh, Sandia. Um, Legal tells me I should clarify that Intel does not have a, uh, a core quantum qubit entangled device. I stole that image from Google Images. But it's where we want to get to, right? We want to build quantum hardware that we know how to control very well. The particular kind of tomography that I want to focus on is state tomography, estimating quantum states inside these quantum information processors. And state tomography in infinite dimensional Hilbert space is a really, really hard thing to do. By infinite dimensional Hilbert space, I mean that we have some sort of continuous variable system. So you know, we might make some measurements. From these measurements, we might try and plot a Wigner function, right? a nice little way of representing this quantum state in phase space. Equivalently, we might be tempted to try and write down a density matrix. You know, these are different ways of representing the same thing. And the whole point of state tomography is to go from the data on the left to one of these two representations, perhaps both, on the right. Now, why is this hard? Well, it's hard because we actually have to get these things. So for instance, when you try and write down a Wigner function, you take your data, and then you do some inverse radon transform business. And then well, you get an estimate that's maybe a little wiggly. So then you try and smooth it out by applying some filters. Or maybe before you do your estimate, you actually bin the data together and then go back and try and do your estimate. You know, formally, infinite dimensional Hilbert space means that the matrix that you use should be infinity by infinity. That's a really big matrix. We're not going to write that one down. Both of these problems suffer from the fact that what we are essentially doing is attempting to estimate an infinite number of parameters using only a finite amount of data. And statisticians would say, no way. Don't do that stuff, dude. Don't do it. So we're going to find a better way. And we're going to make it easier by observing that huh, you don't really need that infinite dimensional matrix. Usually, you can get away with a smaller one. And from finite data, we will then estimate finite parameters. That's the goal, to go from this big, huge, infinite dimensional Hilbert space and squash it down into something that adequately and meaningfully can capture what's going on with our data. So you know, what does this mean kind of physically? Well, physically, it means that continuous variable systems in the lab are usually of low energy. Right? We think about the vacuum or one or two or five photon states. What this means is that we can actually well model low energy states in a Hilbert space that is in the span of a truncated Fock basis. That is, we think about having a Hilbert space that has only d dimensions, where we're thinking of the particular Fock basis, vacuum, one quanta, two quanta, et cetera. So what we're thinking about is really that we start at the origin of phase space, and we're just going to expand Hilbert space outwards like that. Or in terms of a matrix representation, we'll start with what I'm going to call a qubit model that's spanned by the vacuum and the first excited state, and then a qtrit model, first uh, ground, first excited state, second excited state, and you just sort of expand out like that. And what this means is that we're actually going to have an algorithm for figuring out what our Hilbert space should be. And it roughly runs like this. Take some data, do some experiments, and then proceed to iterate through Hilbert space comparing the model D, a model with D uh, dimensions, to a model in D plus 1 dimensions. And if you find that that larger model fits significantly better, well, then use that model. Otherwise, stay with the model that you currently have. 
okay, I mean, is this it? Are we done? You know, what, first of all, what does it mean to compare a model to another? Like, what numbers are we going to use or whatnot? Well, thank goodness statisticians have thought about this type of problem a long time ago, and so they just give us a quantity. The quantity is called the log likelihood ratio statistic. There is a formula. Uh, I've tried to use very few formulas. The only reason this formula is here is because I want to emphasize that it is a number that an experimentalist can calculate that would compare two different Hilbert space dimensions. And you'll see on the far right that it's got some maximums over likelihoods. And you know, for those of you who are experts in likelihoods, this is just the way that we're going to quantify how good our model is fitting. The important thing is that this number, lambda, can tell us something about how well these two models do in fitting the data when we compare them to each other. So in terms of this statistic, the algorithm actually gets a little bit simpler and much more precise. We're going to still take some data. We're going to compare Hilbert space dimension d to Hilbert space dimension d plus 1 using the log likelihood ratio statistic. But we have to come up with this idea of a stopping criterion. And this, is, this criterion is the focus of my work telling you exactly what number you should be comparing the number you calculate using your data to some, what I call, threshold. And the rule is going to be that if your observed value is larger than that threshold, then we should reject that smaller model. Otherwise, keep that smaller model. So what does this look like in practice? Well, we can take those 484 simulated heterodyne measurement outcomes from a few slides ago and uh, you know, I did some maximum likelihood estimation. What we're looking at here are estimates in different Hilbert space dimensions. You know, comparing a qubit model to a qtrit, uh, d equals 4, d equals 5. So just looking at these, can any of you tell me which one of these fits the data the best? No. I thought not, right? <laughs> so what we can do is, uh, well, since I know what the true state is, I'm just going to calculate the fidelity between my estimate and that true state. Huh. It looks like that d equals 4 estimate has the highest fidelity with the true state. So that must be the best estimate, right? because it's the closest to the true state. Well, that's great, but uh, I knew the true state. So what's the point? That's, it would kind of be a stupid thing to do. If, if, this, if this was the end of my talk, then you'd be like, this is not even science, dude. What we're going to observe is that actually the log likelihood ratio statistic will lead us to the conclusion that the d equals 4 model is the best without having to know what that true state was. And that's huge. We'll be able to identify the correct Hilbert space dimension without having to know anything about that underlying true state. We're just going to compare different models and see what this statistic tells us to do. So now we actually get to some numerical work that, that I've been working on. And the crucial observation is that that threshold that I'm going to write down will tell us when that smaller model fits worse. So we have a couple plots going on here. On the left, we're, we're looking at um, histograms over various measurement records of the log likelihood ratio statistic comparing the qubit to the qtrit and the qtrit to the d equals 4 model. With 25 data points, we see that the two-dimensional model is rejected because it sits above this blue line. This blue line is a threshold that I put on the plots completely arbitrarily. It is just an illustratory uh, sort of thing. On the other hand, with 25 data points, we'd fail to reject the d equals 3 model. If we take more data, we see both of these histograms get shifted way out there. Notice the arrow. We go from values on the order of 20 to values on the order of hundreds. Same threshold, we conclude that we need to reject both d equals 2 as well as d equals 3. The crucial observation here, and, and the statistics uh, reasoning for this, is that when your smaller models fail to fit well, this statistic will grow with the number of samples you take. So essentially, the most naive way that you could choose Hilbert space dimension is take an infinite amount of data and compute the statistic and see if it's order infinity or not. If it's about infinite, reject that smaller model. Otherwise, you're OK. What happens, though, once we go past this d equals 4 model? What does the statistic tell us? Well, when one smaller model will fit well, every other larger model will also fit well. 
So when we look at the histograms comparing 4 to 5 and 5 to 6, both of them are below the threshold. You might say, well, gee, what, what, well, now what do we do? We look at the algorithm. The algorithm tells us that when we find a dimension for which comparing it to the next larger model is below the threshold, we stop. We're done. We look at, I'm not exactly sure what color that is, but it's definitely the not gray color. We look at those results and we say, OK, they're below the threshold. We pick D equals 4. Now, I've sort of ended this slide here by observing that what I'm doing right now is actually trying to figure out analytically what these thresholds are supposed to be, guided by a little bit of numerics. Thank you. <laughs>